Now I will start with this whiteboard a little bit because this will be almost entirely a mathematical talk. So I want to give a little bit of motivation uh, the, as much as I could gather and in the end I would request whoever if they can come up with some physical uh, source for examples of the formula that or kind of object I will write down. Okay, so physicists have been a quantum mechanics or quantum physics, I should have said. Uh, there is a expression called Crane, the great Ukrainian mathematician, Crane's trace formula. Well, physicists don't know it by this name, but they know it by another terminology. It is a, it is a kind of a formula which relates the so-called phase shift in scattering theory, which is a physicist sort of paradigm in quantum mechanical or any kind of scattering theory, there will be a phase shift. And so some kind of a, I should not say phase shift, I should say some kind of an aggregate oops, or averaged phase shift. And this says the following. So let me state it a little bit precisely. So you are given two Hamiltonian. This, this is the so-called free Hamiltonian, and this is the potential or some perturbation thereof, such that these are two self-adjoint operators in some Hilbert space H. Actually, statement is quite abstract. It could be in any Hilbert space. But to do quantum mechanics, of course, we will have to connect with physical space and let me keep it R3. So if this potential, which is given by multiplication by a function, V of x, and if I want that function, if I keep it as L2 intersection L1, that means it is going down to zero at infinity at a reasonable rate, then it is known or it can be proven with very little effort. That is, this is called the resolvent of the total Hamiltonian minus the resolvent of the free Hamiltonian. This is trace class, this is, that is traceable in this Hilbert space and what is important is the formula for the trace and that is Crane's <coughs> contribution this has a formula an integral form so the statement of the theorem is the following there exists a unique L1 function, L1 on R, such that this equality holds. This is an equality, mind you. So the important thing is what is this object? This is called Crane's function or Crane shift function. And this is the object which is related to the phase shift. And it goes like this. For physicists, I would say it is up to a pi factor logarithm of maybe there is a 2 pi, I am not sure, uh, the S matrix of the scattering problem, S of lambda. Of course, defining logarithm there is an issue, but I won't go into that. So that is how, sorry, it should be a trace. Now, this trace and this trace are not the same because this lambda is the energy as you can imagine lambda this oh, this lambda and this lambda well doesn't matter mu this is the integration variable there mu is the energy so it is bounded below some mu naught let's say which could be negative and uh, 
So this is a unitary operator for every mu or almost all mu to be more precise. Uh, this is a unitary operator in a, so S mu is unitary in a component space actually in L2 of S2, the two dimensional sphere embedded in three dimension. Okay. So for every mu, it is a unitary operator here. So that's why the trace is in that space, namely here, every fixed energy. So this is a portion of Klein's formula. Now abstractly, Klein's formula says the following, Klein's theorem. This is a very special case of Klein's theorem. Klein's theorem says H H0, now it is abstract statement, H and H0 are two self-adjoint operators in some Hilbert space such that H minus H0 is in trace class. A potential cannot be in trace class, no multiplication operator unless it is discrete value it cannot be trace class. So this is a, this does not immediately apply to quantum mechanics, but it can be walked around such that and take any function, let's say nice class, Schwarz class of R, that is smooth functions decreasing at infinity rapidly. For every such function, phi of H, so you form by functional calculus the operators, function of this self adjoint operator and a function of this self adjoint operator. Statement is this is trace class, but more important, importantly, the formula. There exists a function xi which is L1 unique such that this is related that way. Now to make the contact with geometry which I will try to do soon, I will write it as this. These two I combine, combine and write it as d5. And xi lambda has some expressions. The original proof of Crane used complex function theory. But subsequently many other proofs came about with Vaikulescu and myself as well, where you use more operator theoretic methods. Sorry, there is a trace of the imaginary part of the logarithm. This trace is in the full space. There is no other space here because this is an abstract statement in some Hilbert space. Okay. So this is the imaginary part of this operator, a logarithm of this operator, and then you take the trace, and then you take the limit going down to the real axis. So that's the expression of Crane. Now you can interpret this formula in more ways than one. I will in the end take the more geometric interpretation, but you can for example think of it as a mean value theorem for operator functions under trace. So, so you are increasing this operator by an operator at, uh, increment, which happens to be small in certain sense, trace class sense. I think some uh, speaker here used that phrase of smallness given by the Shatten classes. So in that sense, this is small. Then this difference remains small. And how small is given by the derivative. And that is that sort of smacks of mean value theory. Okay. <coughs> so 
Well, one plus is this is particularly easy because it is one means identity here. Uh, because this is a trace class operator. So V is trace class. So imagine as if you have diagonalized it. It is not self-adjoint, so you may not be able to diagonalize so easily. But imagine as if you have diagonalized it. So it is the product of the eigenvalues will give you determinant. And the logarithm, trace of the logarithm is the log of the determinant. Okay? So it is actually an infinite product. And when you take the log, it will become infinite sum. So think of it that way. So actually, quantum anybody physics, this formula sometimes some sort of same formula is appearing when you are calculating the spectral density. Spectral density. Well, this is you see essentially that comes because this you can easily see by a trivial algebra is nothing but. Okay, and this, the inverse, which is the resolvent, is the name that mathematicians use, uh, is in concrete cases when the Hilbert space is, say, L2 over a configuration space, like R3, Rn, etc., then it is the Griggs function. That's why it appears in the spectral density calculations. Okay? Okay, I want to go on. So, of course, there was the question immediately after Crane's theorem came. By the way, Crane's theorem was announced in 58, but the full proof came in probably 60. That is the distance between Dokladi and, I forget, the Russian journal where he published it. It, was, it is in Russian. So, this, then this was extended by Koplyenko. Though his proof was wrong, the following, he went to the second order. So everything remains same. So, so second order mean value theorem, you would deduct the first derivative in some sense. But now you are in a slight complicated but not too complicated situation. You have a function of n infinite dimensional operator, you have to differentiate with respect to the infinite dimensional operator increment. But these all were done by essentially made ready by fresh A. So this is a fresh A derivative of the function phi h at h naught acting on V. So that is the so this is an operator actually. Okay, it's operator on operator and this is acting on V. So this object is what he looked at. So he showed that if V is Hilbert Schmidt now, as you would expect intuitively, then this is trace class, but that is not the most important thing. Important thing is the formula for the difference. And as you would expect, second derivative appears, and there is a function. But what is and this eta is unique, L1, but what is still mysterious, I don't think anyone has understood why it is positive, but it is positive. This function is a positive L1 function and unique. So this genre of formula is lends credence to the terminology, this is an operator mean value theorem. However, our interest is different. So now I will move to the more geometric interpretation for which I must thank Parthasarathy Chakraborty. We had a brief discussion once and he did help me in sort of getting this a little clarified. And that's why Pons cyclic cohomology comes a little handy, though not in a big way but in a small way. So now we want to investigate a possible trace formula in two dimensions. So far we are in one dimension. What does it mean? The problem is the following. 2 or n, if I can do 2, I can do n. 
So two dimension means I have a tuple of self-adjoint operators, but now I am forced to impose boundedness. So that bounded self-adjoint. Crane's theorem is valid for unbounded self-adjoint operators. So I have a tuple, two tuples. <coughs> they are pairwise commuting. Such that is Hilberschmidt. And take a function of two variables now, smooth function of two variables, and by functional calculus form the function of h and form the function of h0 pair, function of the pair h1, h2 and function of the pair h1, 0, h2, 0. That is simple and it is quite easy to see that this is also Hilbert Schmidt. Now the question is, what is the right object to look for, for which I will have a trace formula? Okay? And that's where Partho came in and we had a discussion. So this is the input, let's say. So what kind of trace formula we can, we can hope to look for. So that's where Kant's ideas were useful. So let's say we take this function or a more restrictive function, it doesn't matter. So I take So I take functions phi j, j equal to 1, 2. So this is a, this is a star algebra. So I take two representations of that star. It's a commutative star algebra. I take two representations. I call it pi 1, which is the, let's say the, this one. And pi 2 for another function, phi 2, is phi 2 of h. Okay. Clearly, they are representations in the Hilbert space, where we started with. And take the Fredholm module, quite standard. And the grading, if you want, is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Very simple. Uh, two-point model actually. <laughs> and if you compute following, okay, well, I have to double it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So pi of phi is just doubling. Uh, So I have taken essentially direct sum of the Hilbert space that I started with and there I introduce these things and compute following Kohn's prescription of pi f by phi. I think it will be this, maybe I am wrong, maybe by a sign, I may be wrong by a sign. The commutator works out to be this. And then, so what will be the candidate for the two form in Kohn's cyclic homology for this model? So, So take two functions, phi 1 and phi 2, as we did earlier. So for example, I'll ignore the gamma.
So I take that form and open it out and I will get trace of phi1 of h minus phi1 of h0 times phi2 of h minus phi2 of h0 for two functions phi1 and phi2 coming from a nice class of functions. So if we believe in Kant's ideas then we should look for a formula for this object. Okay. And now I can go back, go to my slides. So that's what I mean by two variable formula. When I say two variable formula, test formula, I have to know of what I should <coughs> compute the trace. And Kant's theory gives us at least a candidate which you should look for. Okay, now, okay. These are just notation which is more or less standard. P for polynomial, C for continuous function. Okay, so this, I think I've explained some of these. Okay, these I don't, I want to skip. Yeah, so ask a natural qu a question is uh, for a pair of commuting self-adjoint n tuples, appropriate adaptation of Crane's formula to two or higher dimension. That is the aim. Now, the kind of proof that we want to get into, because the Crane's original proof uses function theory, as I said. If I have to go to multi-dimension, then I have to use multi-dimensional com complex function theory. I don't want to get into that. No one has tried it either. So we took this route of which, uh, which uh, I think uh, we successfully navigated using for one variable, more operator theoretic method. I don't know which one. Oops, I did something very wrong. Where? So there is this uh, famous set of theorems due to Hermann Weyl and then followed by von Neumann and then followed by Berg, which is to show that given a self adjoint, oh, they did it for bounded operators, I extended it for unbounded operators, that given a self adjoint operator with any spectrum, I can find another self-adjoint operator which has only eigenvalues such that its difference is small in the sense of Shatten class. But it is also known that that Shatten class cannot be trace class. So it has to be higher Shatten class. Original proof of Weil and von Neumann was Hilberschmidt, but that has been extended to any Shatten class greater than one. Uh, that is for single operator and I'm just wondering which one gives the pointer, the top one? Middle one, is it? Okay. Ah, yeah. So that's why, how I made a mess. <laughs> okay. So for single operator, it was Weil von Neumann. More than one operator was tried by Berg first and he could only show that he can achieve this up to a compact operator. Okay. That is the difference is compact operator. Of course, it should be, there should be caution. If the original operator has only continuous spectrum, the approximating operator can have eigenvalues, but those eigenvalues will be necessarily everywhere dense. So that caution you have to keep. They're not isolated. They cannot be isolated. In fact, you can prove. Okay, so now, so Bart did it for compact, up to compact, and we extended it to the Shatten class. Hypolescu did also the same. Okay. So this is the approximate. Okay, this I have already said. Let's go to our first theorem. Now, not only you have to approximate it up to a Shatten class, but we have to approximate and commuting n tuple by commuting n tuple. Okay. So that's a, another demand which is we have to uh, we have to achieve. So this is the statement of that theorem which achieves that. So you have, this is for any number, finite number n, be a commuting family of bounded self-adjoint operators in an infinite dimensional separable. Separability is absolutely essential. A separable Hilbert space, then there exists a sequence of finite rank projections such that this projection increase to identity as n goes to infinity and such that 
there exists a commuting, commuting family of bounded self-adjoint operators B super N with the properties that for every certain index greater than or equal to N and for every for each I that means you can do the job with the same P for all I's that is also important such that this B I N lives in a finite dimension firstly that's what this commutation says and it approximates AI in the P Schatten norm that means difference is in Schatten norm P and that difference goes to zero so it is an approximation statement and furthermore these properties are there so B I N P N essentially an increasing family of operators approximating AI. AI is there? Oh, I think it didn't say here. They are positive. But positivity is not any real restriction. I can always shift it around by adding the norm, etc. Okay? So this is the main, uh, the theorem, approximation theorem, which is absolutely crucial. So I won't go through the proof. Okay, now, so idea is, we prove the trace formula in finite dimension first and then go to the infinite dimension. Finite dimension, it is a relatively trivial exercise. It is integration by parts. Yes. So we are, so, but we need two different projections because going back to the previous theorem, note, yeah. So this approximating, this projection and the approximating family all depend crucially on the original set of operators that you have started with. So for the unperturbed operator, operators H0 or H01 and H02, I will have one projection. And for H1, H2, I will have another projection. Okay. They will be finite dimensional, all right, but they need not commute and so on. Because don't forget, H and H0 do not commute. Okay, that's why two, two finite dimensional projections have been introduced. Assume furthermore the two commuting pairs of bounded self-adjoint tuples are acting in the common reducing subspace PH and QH respectively. That means PH reduces this one, QH reduces that one. And P and Q do not have to do with anything with each other necessarily, etc. There is a spectral statement. I embed the spectrum in a large enough interval and phi and psi are C1 because I'm in a finite interval, so I don't need S functions. So C1 is enough. Then one has this formula. But with this projection sitting there at appropriate places. And this integral is over the square, AB square in two dimension. Here is the uh, derivative of the first function. Notice this is not a function of two variable here. I'm taking a simple case a function of one variable each, but this is one variable that is the other variable. That's why there is only derivative with respect to one coordinate, x and this is the y. And there is a function xi xy dx dy. So this is the crane-like formula where z you can write down in explicitly in terms of spectral families of these operators. Okay, the proof is, uh, over, I mean, uh, one of the main technique is essentially what is called, uh, there are two expressions and we combine the two expressions. This is called the divided difference formula. Uh, I mean, the same expression can be written in two different ways. Here is one, which comes, oops, which comes from integration by parts. The other one comes from a little bit of a jugglery. I won't explain. The jugglery is in by introducing this divided difference, I have managed to get here an, an operator valued measure. If this is an operator valued measure, now luckily this is a Hilbert Schmidt valued measure, therefore I can use, in fact, it's a spectral measure in the Hilbert space of Hilbert Schmidt operators. Because don't forget H2 minus H20 is trace class, H1 minus H10 is. Uh, sorry, H1 root minus 20 is Hilbert Schmidt, and this is also Hilbert Schmidt. It is written here somewhere. Okay. 
Okay. So this is a spectral family acting on the Silbersmith operator from the left and another one from the right. You can easily co compute that this is a spectral family on the Hilbert space of Hilbert Schmidt operators. The left multiplication and right multiplication. And then I have taken this, that's why I have written in the form of an inner product with a 2 to indicate it the Hilbert Schmidt, Hilbert space inner product. And this is a, a vector in the Hilbert Schmidt space. So I have looked at it as an inner product in the Hilbert Schmidt space. Now this is, notice uh, this is. Uh, something, if P goes away and Q goes away, this expression stands. That is the intention of having this expression. If P and Q are identity, this expression has a meaning. Whereas, the previous expression here doesn't have any meaning. If I, because what is stress class? I mean, these are all continuous spectrum possibly. Therefore, none of these are stress class operators. But it is P and Q being finite dimensional is forcing it to have meaning. But in the end, I want to let P and Q disappear. So that is why I need two expressions to compare and to use some appropriate mathematical theorem to get rid of this P and Q or take the limit in other words. Okay. Okay, this is the theorem for this special combination. That is, if this is a function of one of the two variables, this is a function of the other <coughs> of the two variables. And we have, here we have restricted to polynomials, but it is extendable to C, C1 functions easily. So what do we do? We, we have two expressions for the same thing. Okay? One has a limit, other doesn't. So essentially we use uh, Haley's theorem, essentially, to make a selection of or weak star uh, compactness to select a suitable subsequence. Okay, here is a sort of a brief proof. We show, uh, okay, I won't, we show that the, yeah. So first we show that the object that you are looking for, namely the left hand side, can be approximated by this truncated object or finite dimensional. That is the first thing to show. So this is P and this is Q of the previous expression. In other words, we reduce the problem to a finite dimensional problem. Okay. Once we have done that, then you see I have two expressions for P and Q here. I had written here P and Q in the lemma, but here it is Pn and P0n. Pn is the one which helps truncate this H1, H2 pair and P0n is the one which helped me truncate H, H10, H20 pair. That's why there are two different projections appear. So this first one is the finite dimensional formula. Second one is the divided difference formula where this measure is given here, sorry, here. So by comparing, we can say that mu and delta that over any Borel set is given by an integral of this i n function which is valid for finite dimension. So for each n, the measure mu n is absolutely continuous. There is no problem with that. That is a trivial statement. Okay, now we take the divided difference formula and look at the measure a little more carefully. So let me, yeah. So what do we do? We first extend, yeah, psi and phi. So psi x y is phi prime x psi prime y. I just introduce a notation for the product. Okay. Then this is a function which is nice. So if it was c one, then this is a continuous function, and this integral is given by the other form, where I have rewritten this divided difference in this way. You can easily see phi prime I integrate I will get this one. If psi prime I integrate I will get this one. So I have written as an integral of psi x y. This is an indefinite integral divided by the increments. Why I did that? The next page will explain. I want to bound this. 
this left hand side I want to bound by something with respect to psi and that is what we have achieved. So first we extend it to all continuous functions on the square this formula and second we get this bound that is trivial from the divided difference formula this is bounded with respect to x1 x2 and this is a finite measure being a spectral measure okay therefore I have a uniform bound <coughs> and now I can apply Halley's theorem Halley's selection theorem to conclude that there exists a sequence of these measures <coughs> no, uh, subsequence such that it converges uniquely to a Borel measure, complex Borel measure, such that you have the limit given by this integral with respect to the measure. That means we have proven the <coughs> yes, this is what we have proved. How much time do I have? Okay, so we have proven this formula, but for this restricted function set, because this is a function of one variable, it should be two variables actually. Now that we have not yet checked everything, it is going on. That is for actually two variable functions here, two variable functions here. Let me go on to say now, you see that, look at the Crane's old formula or even the Kuplinko formula if it is there, not there, but th this measure in Crane's formula, it was a function of one variable, it was absolutely continuous and that was the main feature of Crane's theorem, that these measures were absolutely continuous. So here the question arises, is this absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure okay, on this square? Or do we ex can we expect it to be, because I have not proved, I mean, I cannot prove at present that this is, a, uh, I mean, I went the other way. I mean, is it at all possible that this is absolutely continuous? And answer is no. And that is something new. Regarding absolute continuity of the measure mu. Unlike the one variable Crane's formula, we note the measure is not necessarily absolutely continuous. In fact, the measure may be singular. It may be restricted on the diagonal, for example. So I want to give a counter example and that is the, what I will do for the rest of the talk. Uh, so here is a very special situation that is I take h1 and h2 to be one operator, h1 0, h2 0 to be another operator and take two functions phi and psi, phi of h minus phi of h0 times psi of h times psi of minus psi of h0. So this is quite unlike what I have discussed earlier, Crane's formula or Koplyenko formula, they are different. They are, in a sense, closer to mean value theorem. So, do we expect something like this? Answer is no. That is what next theorem says. We will show separately in the next theorem that such a product which is of course trace class, if H minus H naught is Hilbert Schmidt, this is will be easily trace, uh, trace class, the product, and the trace thereof is actually on the diagonal, is, is concentrated on the diagonal, which is a Lebesgue measure zero set in the, in the square. So this is what, I, the, I, in other words, we can think of the Xi function in the previous page as something like a delta measure concentrated on the diagonal, that's what it means which contradicts the fact that xi is in L1, so it can, there cannot be a xi which is in L1. So let me just state that theorem and maybe motivate it. So this is the, you know, what is the theorem? Okay, we prove this theorem again by the same technology or same philosophy, namely prove it for finite dimension and then go to the limit. So this is the finite dimensional part which is trivial just integration by parts. So do that and eta t is exactly this expression. H minus H naught is bounded and in fact it is finite dimension that's why trace makes sense. Okay. Infinite dimension this trace will not make sense. 
because H minus H0 is not trace class, it is Hilbert Schmidt. Okay, this is what the first line says. Now, what do we do? We take a function which is, uh, let's say, has that its derivative is, uh, doesn't vanish anywhere. Okay. Therefore, psi is invertible and psi prime is also continuously differentiable by inverse function theorem. And set g naught to be psi h naught and g to be psi h. Okay. <coughs> then both g and g naught are bounded self adjoint operator and therefore interchanging the spectral variable to the spectral variable of h naught because you just go by functional calculus to the new spectral variable and you by the previous, so I'm still in finite dimension. Psi of H minus Psi of H naught, I can rewrite in terms of this new self adjoint operator G and G naught this way. And then a little bit of analysis shows that the eta primes that comes from the previous lemma is actually Psi prime eta. So eight, so eta, so here we show that eta is, is a, is, I mean, by taking an arbitrary alpha, we show that eta psi is nothing but psi prime times eta almost everywhere. Therefore, we get the theorem that I announced in finite dimension that is here. This is finite dimensional statement. Now, how do we go to infinite dimension? Here. This is the theorem. So again, we uh, use wild von Neumann kind of approximation theorem. And here there is only a pair of operator H and H naught. So one projection will do the job. And we show that this trace is approximable by finite dimensional traces. Therefore, by finite dimensional theorem, we get that this is a limit of this. Now, of course, we have to prove that etas converge. And that is the little bit of analysis. We, sh we show that the trace of the finite dimension is given by this. So I get a sequence eta n for each n, which refers to the, it is not the dimension of the space, but the dimension is related to capital N. It will be, a, it will be probably a polynomial in N. The dimension will be a polynomial function of N. Uh, so it is this object, we have to show this converges for every t. And that is the rest of the proof. We, we try to show that converges in L1 norm by taking a, by showing that it is a Cauchy sequence in L1 norm. And that's a little bit of work, which is not too much. And we, we, we just estimate it and show that eta n eta is a Cauchy sequence in L1 topology and therefore there is a limit. Now we can relax this condition psi prime is not equal to zero anywhere by taking some kind of psi prime is zero in some subset and that's that's enough actually. If I psi prime doesn't vanish in some subset in the spectrum, that's enough. So this theorem, this theorem is proven for any phi and psi which is in C1 on the interval AB uh, and therefore <coughs> by a posteriori that measure can never be absolutely continuous in general. Okay? So one, one way to possibly investigate is to see whether one can have identify a class where you will have this kind of property and the rest will not be so. But anyway, in general, we cannot expect it to be absolutely continuous. Uh, well, there, there, there are some of the references. And I want to say now to the audience at large that this kind of object, forget this, but what I wrote, is there any situation that you can envisage where this product appears 
in some physical or such situations. I could not think of any. So, this kind of expressions, like in the one variable, it comes from quantum theory of scattering. Now, here I have absolutely no intuition. So, I would just ask people if they can hook up some situation where this kind of object can appear. But remember, there is a the severe restriction is h1, h2 is a commuting pair and h1, 0 is uh, h1, 0, h2, 0 is another commuting pair. And that's a rather severe restriction. And finally, though I did not, we have not yet derived the most general formula, one would expect this formula to be. So far I was good that this formula, actually what the formula I have shown, the function of one variable here is the function of the other variable there. Here what would, what would one expect is there is a measure, I mean, so this is why I, I, we have not yet uh, gone there because we, we do not even have an intuition about what kind of objects you are expecting. What kind of objects we are expecting is the sort of Poisson bracket between phi 1 and phi 2 and the measure. <coughs> the symplectic form is, is going to appear in some natural way. There is a two variable Poisson bracket. So this distress formula will be in terms of the Poisson bracket between phi 1 and phi 2 and some measure. I cannot get rid of, I, this measure is in general not going to be absolutely continuous, that I have argued, but this is what is expected to appear. We have, because we have not taken the two variables fully, that's why only one derivative is occurring. And that's it, that's all I have to say. Thank you.